a round of applause for the IHA. Wow. This cruise, putting this together. I mean, really nice job. Thank you, Shannon. I think she's in the other room, but um, this is our first cruise seminar. I, we're having a great time, so um, that was fun. Also, um, I, I do want to just extend a thank you to um, pretty much every other doc that talked before me. You know, they basically, through their hard work, through their efforts, through their research, you know, they've basically paved a way for hyperbaric oxygen to get to the place where it is today. And uh, I just want to give a, a thank you to all those doctors. Please, another round of applause. You know, it's allowing us to have this conference. It's allowing me to stand here and have that conversation. So, um, you know, debt of gratitude to those folks. So, as we get started, uh, anybody else really excited about the mitochondria besides me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Let me see if this is working. Oh, this isn't working. Wrong button? The down button. Okay, that's a fun video. If you're ever bored and want to go to YouTube, it's a funny mitochondria song. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so some mitochondria facts, some things you probably already knew, some things you might not already know. But obviously the mitochondria is in charge of energy production. Without, the, um, with, without oxygen being present, you know, pretty inefficient system. All we have is glycolysis. And uh, we're only making about two ATP, but in the presence of oxygen, using glucose, which we're going to talk about other substrates that we might burn for energy, but using glucose, again, depending on uh, what you read, 32 to 36 ATP. So it's a much more efficient system when we have oxygen present. Uh, some things you might not know about the mitochondria, it would be that uh, it has its own genome. So it has 37 of its own genes, 13 of which are geared specifically towards oxidative phosphorylation. So it's, it's able to learn from and adapt to the environment and actually make changes to itself based on that. And some of those changes include things down below, uh, down below like uh, changing its size, changing its shape, uh, fusing together when necessary, increasing its density, as well as plays a huge role in apoptosis, which a lot of the other docs have mentioned earlier. We get our uh, mitochondria from our mom. So sperm cells do have mitochondria, but they die off once the egg is fertilized. So for all you with mitochondria, say thanks, Mom. <laughs> and we need ATP for everything. There's not a single thing that our body doesn't require energy to do. So every muscle contraction, every thought, every breathing, every synapse, every single thing that happens inside your body requires ATP, therefore requires some sort of mitochondrial function. Everything but red blood cells. Red blood cells do not have their own mitochondria. But every other cell needs mitochondria, it needs ATP synth synthesis on some level as its fuel for any energy production that we're doing. And it's really, it's a beautiful symphony, right? We don't even get energy from food, right? We don't actually get energy directly from our food. We actually have to take our food, our fat, our carbohydrates, our proteins, and we have to break those things down into substrates, pyruvate, right? And then we have to start passing electrons along. NADH, FADH2, and it's through that system, through that mitochondria, that we're actually uh, creating, as Ros Dr. Rosignol had mentioned, like a battery within the matrix of the uh, mitochondria to create a process where we could create this ATP. And the only byproducts are a little bit of carbon dioxide and some water. And so it's really a beautiful process to understand and to, uh, to be able to understand it so that therapeutically we can know how to make changes to it when needed. And so that's what we're going to talk about. I don't know why my slides are a little funny over here, but um, it says mitochondrial function. So what we're going to talk about today is how do we manipulate the environment? We know that mitochondria plays an enormous role in so many of the dysfunctions and the chronic illnesses in today's kids and today's adults. And so what factors can we put toward that mitochondria to change its environment so that it could learn to adapt? And if it could learn to adapt, could we then get higher percentages of ATP production and less consequences of the mitochondrial dysfunction? And so that's what we're going to talk about today. So these are this is my crew. Maybe you saw us walking around the boat. That's my kids, Levi in the blue vest, Wyatt in the white vest, Kaya in between me and Melissa. Melissa, also a chiropractor. We work together in our office. Um, as you can see from their beautiful faces, they also get their mitochondria from their mother. <laughs> But the reason we're here is, for me is this, you know? I'm sure most of you have heard a sentence something like this um, in your reading. And, and you all have your own stories. 
right? You all have your own experiences, either with your own families or with patients and their families. And we know that illness today is skyrocketing. And we know that chronic illness, especially in kids, is at astronomical levels. And I have to say that it's in a room like this, with doctors like you, taking time out of your lives to learn things like hyperbaric oxygen, that I believe will make a difference in that story. And I, and I hope to see that we can change this. So I am Dr. Jason Zahners. I am a chiropractor uh, with and Melissa, my wife. And we have six other chiropractors that work in our office. We specialize in a little bit of everything. We have six other docs, and so we do some functional medicine, we do functional neurology, we do pediatric, prenatal, postpartum, um, sports injuries, we have a functional neurologist, did I say that out loud yet? And so, you know, together what we're trying to do is we're trying to put together plans where we can handle a very large range of ages and a very large range of conditions that we're able to help. We also use other modalities like infrared, which we're going to be talking about today, nutrition, which we're going to be talking today, and hyperbaric, obviously, which we're going to be talking about today. We've been using HBOT in our office since 2009. Uh, we currently have one soft and one hard chamber in our office, and we also help patients with um, rentals or purchasing if they can't get to our office or it's not appropriate to do so. So we believe in HBOT. We believe that it plays a huge role in many of the conditions that uh, you and I are seeing every day in our office. So here's our little bit of a roadmap that we're going to be going through. So we talked a little bit about mitochondria, why it's so important, how much fun it is to learn about. Um, we're going to go into next chronic illness and chronic illness in the U.S. So, you know, show of hands, I mean, do these look pretty familiar? I mean, these are pretty much the most common chronic illnesses that I think all of us are dealing with in our office. Some of us specialize in one or two of them. Some of us might see a variety of them. But at the end of the day, this is a list of all the chronic, not all, but most of the chronic illnesses that are plaguing the U.S. So heart disease, stroke, diabetes, Alzheimer's, neurotransmitter disorders, you can read the list. But, you know, we're trying to have an impact. And as one of the docs, I think it was Dr. New earlier today, said, you know, listen, when it comes down to it, yeah, they're inflammatory diseases, but it's a really, it's a mitochondrial issue. If our mitochondria aren't able to make the energy they need to make or kill off cells when they're supposed to kill off our cells, the apoptosis, we're going to have a hard time uh, managing inflammatory disease and as a result we're going to start getting lists of conditions like this. And so how are things going so far? Let's say in the last 30 years, how are the rates of autoimmunity? Are they going up, going down, staying, yeah, right? Cancer, heart disease, stroke, your name, right? So with, with, with a lot of money, true or false, the U.S. spends more money than any other country in the world on healthcare. True. So it's not for lack of funding. But with best efforts in traditional medicine, we're seeing still enormous rates of all of these diseases. We're basically not making a great dent in this process, in my opinion. Last time I checked, I believe the U.S. was 37th healthiest country. I, I can't name 37 other countries, period, let alone 37 that would just actually deserve to be, you know, in a, in a state that they're healthier than that we are, given our education and our ability to influence that monetarily. So again, how are the trends going? I mean, in New Jersey, I remember not that long ago, autism, I think it was about one in 100. More recently, it was one in 59. Even more recently, it was one in 34 in, in kids and, and boys in New Jersey. Dementia, I mean, it's coming, right? 2050, it's supposedly one in two in all adults over 65. I mean, that's not old, right? These are diseases that, you know, especially dementia and cancer, Right? One, depending on which type of cancer we're talking about, headed towards one in four, diabetes one in three. It's not like we're making a dent and these things are coming quick and they're coming fast and they're coming hard at us. And I don't think in traditional medicine we're making the dent we need to make. And I think part of that, I mean here, what's the first sign of a heart attack? Death. Chest pain. Death. What else? <laughs> Chest pain. Right? Chest pain, difficulty breathing, right? If you're having that, what are you having? Heart having heart attack. What's the first sign of a stroke? Right, droopiness, a little droop, right, I think you're having a stroke. So the first sign of most chronic illness is the illness itself. And yet we know that it takes months, typically years, sometimes decades, for a lot of these illnesses to develop. Yet the first real sign of the condition is the condition. And at that point, it's not too late. We could still treat it, but it's kind of too late. There's so much we could have done for so many years before that happened to actually impact these people's lives. And so what I want to offer to you today is that we need to become doctors at the bottom there. It says doctors of cause rather than doctors of effects. 
If we could start digging a little bit deeper and start looking at the causes of these illnesses and start intervening sooner in these patients' lives, right? How many patients come in with a you know, glucose of 105 and an A1C of 6.2 and we're like, well, you're not diabetic yet. Come back next year. We'll see if you're diabetic next year, right? We're not, but, but we have clear signs that this person needs help, but we're, they're not getting the intervention that they need. So um, if we become doctors of cause, the causes of these issues, rather than the doctors of the effects of these conditions, then I believe that we'll start making a much bigger dent in that, that list of uh, conditions. And so what does chronic illness have to do with the mitochondria? Just to simplify it, because I don't have a lot of time, um, you know, here's what we call the pillars of chronic illness, okay? And it's not that every one of those diseases that I talked about earlier has every single one of these pieces, and it's not like it has to go in this particular order, but just to give you an idea of where, um, you know, where, where we see it coming from. I, I see that there's some type of tissue damage along the way. Maybe that's a toxicity, maybe that's a metal, maybe it's an injury, maybe it's a stroke, maybe it's a beginning of cancer developing, maybe it's uh, food intolerances that a per patient has. But there's some type of tissue damage which leads to a decrease in blood flow, some type of hypoperfusion. And as a result of the hypoperfusion, we can't feed the cells the nutrients that those cells need to get and we can't get rid of the waste products that are just a natural cause of normal cellular respiration. And so what has to happen? They start, they start to get sick and they start to get inflamed. And as a result, we get inflammation throughout the body, but primarily we get a lot of GI inflammation and neuroinflammation. As we get GI inflammation, we start to get metabolic changes. We can't break our foods down as well. We become less acidic. We have less enzymes. Our microbiome changes, so we get immune system dysfunction. From the neuroinflammation, we get changes in brain chemistry, synapse ability from uh, neurotransmitter balances. As a result of all that, we get increased oxidative stress, increased reactive oxidative, uh, oxygen species. We get further epigenetic and, and DNA damage, which then leads to further tissue damage. And then that cycle just basically continues. And so somewhere along the way, where we can intervene, you know, most of us do this every day. We need to intervene along this pathway and start making changes well before we actually get the condition that we're, you know, we're headed for. If you know what to look for, you could see the true or false when, when you evaluate patients at a, at a deeper level, you can see the road they're on. True or false? That was a question. True. true. <laughs> right? And so when we, as doctors here, start to look at that and we start to understand the path they're on, we can change that so much more easily. So Shannon said to me, she said, Jason, I'd love to have you come and uh, you know, present to, for the IHA conference. But she said, listen, you, you just can't use the word treat. You can't say you're treating this disease with hyperbaric. I said, Shannon, I don't know if you know this, or I don't know if you guys know this, but I'm a chiropractor. I'm not allowed to treat anything. <laughs> so I think we're good. <laughs> and so I use hyperbaric like that. I don't look at hyperbaric as treating disease anyway. I look at hyperbaric as restoring function, okay? I look at this, you know, in chiropractic philosophy, if you will, we believe that you're, we're self-healing and self-regulating. What does that mean? It means if it's cold, we get warmer. If, it's, if it were hot, we get cooler. If we cut ourselves, we bleed and then we clot and then we heal, right? When we eat food, we bite it, we chew it, we swallow it, we assimilate the nutrients, we get rid of the waste. We are constantly, our cells in our body are constantly trying to self-regulate uh, the environment so that we could maintain some level of health. And the way I look at this whole, comp this whole conversation regarding the nutrition and the, and the light and the HBOT that we're going to talk about, I look at that as basically, you know, we're just trying to restore normal, healthy function. The body takes care of the rest. And so a quick conversation, this is, what, this is kind of the conversation I have with patients. It's way too simple for this room, but I'm just really, I'm just sharing it with you because I want you to hear it just so, you know, maybe if you're in your office and you're trying to explain some of these concepts, they're pretty difficult to explain. This is a pretty simple explanation that I offer most patients. And I say, listen, most of these issues, if you go back to that list of chronic illnesses that we talked about and then that cycle of chronic illness, what you could say is that basically it comes down to toxicity and deficiency. Either... You have too much of something that your body's having trouble getting rid of, and we need to help that. Or you're missing something really important, some raw material that your body requires in order to do some sort of function that we're trying to get it to do. And so what we're trying to do is remove people through a continuum of here's toxicity and purity. So we're just saying, hey, how do we just start to move you back towards some level of purity? And here's deficiency and sufficiency. 
can we just start moving this person away from their deficiencies and start moving them back towards their sufficiency? And as a result, like I said, the body self-regulates and self-heals, so once it got, gets rid of all the things that it can't handle, and it starts to get all the things that it needs, it just starts to regulate itself. It's quite magical. And so, uh, I'm, I'm, my head, I think a lot, uh, very mechanically in my head, I, I, I like working on cars and boats and trucks. So, uh, I look at the mitochondria, I look at the cell from that standpoint. And so, just to summarize that quickly, I say, listen, we need some sort of fuel, right? So if your car has the right fuel, gets gasoline, and your engine's working, your pistons are working, your spark plugs are all working, right? You have an oil change, and so the machinery's there. So you put the right fuel in, you have the right machinery, and you have some sort of exhaust system to get rid of the waste, you should be able to move that car from point A to point B pretty well. And that's how I look at our body. We need the right fuel. In some cases, it's glucose. In other cases, it's fat, maybe it's ketones. We're gonna talk about that in a few minutes. But it's also oxygen. Oxygen is part of that fuel system. It is for the car too, by the way. And then as long as you have proper cellular function, right? Your cells are healthy, or at least functioning, you have all the right organelles so you can make your ribosomes and all the things that a cell needs, and mitochondria, so you have all the things that a cell needs, and then you have a way to get rid of the natural exhaust that is just a part of normal, healthy cellular respiration, that cell should be able to function and or at least heal if necessary. And this is the places that we intervene, but we don't think about it like that necessarily all the time, but if we can change those fuel sources, if we can increase the capacity for that cell to function or upregulate up cellular function or help that body detox properly, we can start to heal. So mitochondria and the h bot. So uh, before we do that, I, I want to say this, three, three separate thoughts. One is you can't especially these aren't targeted therapies. I'm not talking about targeted th drug therapies that are trying to influence one particular cytokine. Okay? In my mind, what I'm really talking about is offering the body this substrate that it just requires for normal function. And I can't just deliver that right to the mitochondria. I have to give it to the whole body. And so what changes in the mitochondria, it changes in the cell. If it changes in the cell, it changes in the tissue. If it changes in the tissue, it changes the whole organism. And so while we have certain global effects that we'll talk about, specifically in the mitochondria, we have to understand that we're really having, uh, sorry, local effects in the mitochondria, we're also having global effects throughout the whole body. Um, point number two, what is point number two? Point number two is that there is overlap, you will see, between hyperbaric oxygen, red light therapy, uh, nutrition, or any other chelation, any other therapies that we might be throwing at our patients for whatever the thing that they need. Uh, they're not redundant, okay? So just because there's a similar effect, let's say HBOT might help the mitochondria this way, red light therapy helps the mitochondria in a very similar way, that doesn't make those things redundant. It makes them synergistic. And I believe that in many cases in our office that you know, patients may have tried this one piece or that one piece here or there. But often is the case when you start to combine these that the, the result of the sum of a few therapies having a similar effect is what they needed, and that that total sum is much greater than any one of those treatments could be on their own. So, that being said, we'll get into HBOT a little bit. What I, what I won't do, because it's part of this, but we don't need to, because you already went through it a few times, and I don't have a ton of time. Um, real basic HBOT uh, mechanism, but just again, these are just conversations that I also have with other doctors who are curious, hey, how does HBOT help, help this or that? It's also conversations that I have with patients, but it's a, just a simple way to look at things. So. You've all had a pulse oximeter on your finger, and you all know that sitting here, if you don't have any lung condition or heart condition or anything else that might in, uh, interfere, you know, we're all sitting here about 98 to 100% oxygenated. And think about that for a minute. 100% oxygenated. Right now, you have all the oxygen you could ever really have. And you need 100% oxygen every minute of every day. It's really interesting, because if you look at other nutrients, many nutrients, we have some sort of storage form for, don't we? So like if you didn't have it for a day or two, you'd be okay. But we need 100% saturation of oxygen, roughly, basically every minute of every day, just to sit here for you to have this conversation with me. And so we could go weeks, let's say, but probably months without food. And we can go a couple days without water. But how long can we go without oxygen? A few minutes. And there's no storage for them? It's crazy. Amazing. And I look at that as a nutrient. So think about vitamin C for a minute. If you don't get enough vitamin C, you get a thing called scurvy. scurvy. So a deficiency in vitamin C is called scurvy. We want to make sure we don't get that, so we get some amount of vitamin C north of that level. 
But even further, we might go a little step further and say, well, gee, I don't want to just not have scurvy. I actually want to have enough vitamin C for all the other things that vitamin C does, my immune system, my collagen formation, all the wonderful things vitamin C does. So there's like an optimum range that I try to get every day. And then to take that one step further, periodically I may mega dose vitamin C because I have some other issue that requires much more of that for at least this period of time so that I could heal. Maybe like what Dr. New was talking about with cancer, doing kick up, you know, drips or uh, you just might take a few thousand milligrams daily to help your immune system because you're fighting a cold. So I look at oxygen just like that. I would say that there's some amount of oxygen that if you don't get that amount, you get a thing called hypoxia. That hypoxia could be global or it could be local. You could have a crush injury, you could have a stroke, you could have cancer, you could have TBI. Those would be local ischemia. And if you had one of those issues and I put a pulse ox on your finger, it would still say 100%, well, 98, whatever it is, right? Yet, so you have all the oxygen you could possibly have, yet you still have some area in your body that's hypoxic. So hold that thought for a second. So that's if you're not getting enough. Then there's some range that we need that's theoretically the optimum range. And that optimum range for us is virtually 100%, all of it, every day, every minute. But once in a while, we may choose to mega dose oxygen. We might have an issue that says, you know what? This 100% oxygen, it's not enough. I have this TBI, I have this concussion, I have this cancer, I have this crush injury, whatever the issue is, I have this condition that says, I'm getting 100% oxygen, it's still not enough. So I might choose to mega dose oxygen for some period of time to start to fuel that system and let it heal. The issue is if you're 100% oxygenated, how could you possibly ever get more? You can't be more than 100% oxygenated okay? with pressure. So the only way we have to ever get more than 100% oxygen is by pressurizing the system. Why? Super simple, but we already talked about it, so we'll go quick. Boyle's Law, which basically says, if I take a gas this big and I put a lot of pressure on it, I can make it this big. So as I put more pressure on the gas, I can make it much smaller. And then Henry's Law, which says, the smaller I make it, the more pressure I put on it, the more I could dissolve into fluid. What does that mean to our body? It means if I take a lot of oxygen and I smush it into a chamber and pressurize that chamber, put pressure on that chamber, I could dissolve it into liquid. What kind of liquid? The plasma of your blood. And now all of a sudden, depending on your setup, depending on the amount of pressure, like Dr. Newbrander was saying, OPM, right? Minutes, pressure, oxygen. We can manipulate those three variables, and depending on your setup, you're now gonna dissolve some amount of oxygen into the plasma of the blood and while you might have a TBI, concussion, cancer, all the things I was saying before, where oxygen can't get to that tissue because the capillaries are damaged. If capillaries are damaged, red blood cells can't get there. If red blood cells can't get there, oxygen can't get there. Unless you dissolve oxygen into the plasma of the blood and plasma goes everywhere. So now all of a sudden you have this tissue that was starving, hypoxic, and now you're fueling it with just as much oxygen as it needs. And so that's how we get the healing response through HBO. What are some of the benefits of HBOT? So this is just some of the short-term benefits. Again, we've talked about this a lot this weekend, so we can kind of go quick through some of this. But you get an increase in antioxidants. And some of those antioxidants that are released help offset some of the oxidative stress that HBOT actually uh, creates. So increase in SOD, superoxide dismutase, and, glut and uh, glutathione peroxidase. Increase in rate of oxidative phosphorylation, which we'll talk about in a minute. Some vasoconstriction. Um, decreased inflammation and energy balancing. Increased perfusion, oxy uh, obviously decreased hypoxia, but uh, long term, even more magical, we start to get regulation in the immune system. We get changes in the cytokines, we get balance between neutrophils and macrophages. As Dr. Harch likes to talk about the epigenetic effect, and maybe most of HBOT's effect is in the epigenome. We get neuronal regeneration, we get wound healing, but it doesn't have to be a diabetic ulcer that isn't healing for months on end. Aging is wounds. Aging is cumulative, small, cumulative wounds over our life that aren't necessarily always healing quite as quick as we would want, not as quick as we, they were when we were eight or 10. And so if we have a tool that we could actually help heal these micro wounds cumulatively over time and heal them as they're occurring, we could have a huge effect on the aging process. Uh, antioxidant release, we talked about angiogenesis. Not only are we gonna dissolve oxygen into the plasma to acutely treat whatever issue, whatever tissue is actually hypoxic, or long term, we're gonna build new circulation we're gonna build new capillary beds that are ultimately gonna allow red blood cells to get to that tissue, which means that we don't need to continue to do HBOT for that particular thing, because now it actually has a blood supply on its own, and it can get the oxygen it needs to get rid of the waste that it doesn't, and it could heal. 
We're going to get stem cell release, not just out of the bone marrow, but on the central nervous system, and it also helps kill anaerobic infections. How many, so many, of our pathogens, right? We have more bacteria and, and microbes that live in and on us than we do that have cells that make us up. So our relationship with our microbiome is really important for our health. And so with hyperbaric oxygen, most pathogens are anaerobes. So if pathogens are anaerobes and we're putting them in these high oxygen environments, that helps to kill some of those, or at least make it really uncomfortable for them to live there. At the same time, most of the good bacteria, the probiotic that live in and on us, are aerobes. And so at the same time, we're, we're feeding and fueling the healthy bacteria. We're making it really uncomfortable and potentially killing some of the unhealthy bacteria that live in and on us. What does that have to do with the mitochondria? Well, it's, it turns out oxygen might be a rate-limiting factor for oxidative phosphorylation. In other words, if we had more oxygen available, we can crank out more ATP. That's huge. In Israel, they're doing some tests, uh, some, some, um, some research with uh, dual tasking. So they're taking patients, and they're basically having them do complex cognitive and motor skills simultaneously. It's pretty hard for us to do that. And so their hypothesis was, well, maybe it's just that the only reason we use such a small part of our brain is we're already using 20, you know, the brain uses about 20% of glucose, 20% of the oxygen that we absorb every day. And maybe it's just a fueling issue. In other words, if we had more fuel, could we be capable of more? Could we upgrade our RAM to be capable of performing more complex, more tasks for longer periods of time? And so what they're doing is they're dual tasking these patients and they're exposing them to hyperbaric oxygen, they're dual tasking them again, they're watching them on functional MRI, and what they're seeing is they're capable of more. And so if they're capable of more, what they're saying is basically, as I had more oxygen, I was able to do more. So it's a rate-limiting factor for mitochondrial function. Do you have a study listed in the... I don't, but I can get it for you. Um, they increase mitochondrial density. So the mitochondria, especially in the brain, but pretty much everywhere, um, mitochondria recognize the increased oxygen load that it's being exposed to. And as a result, it says, hey, we can't just sit here and let all this oxygen go to waste. We need to multiply. So it increases its own density to say, listen, if there's so much more oxygen available, let me have more of me so that we can make more oxygen. And then, of course, it also helps with mitochondrial efficiency. Red light. Does anybody in here use infrared, red, near infrared, and all this kind of good stuff? Yeah, good. Cool. Okay. What does that do with mitochondria? Um, so <clears throat> red light, we're just going to talk about light in general for just a moment. So that's the sun. <coughs> Made me think of the cruise. So sunlight is white light, and white light contains the full spectrum of light, right? All the visible light is contained within sunlight. Uh, just to show a picture of that, basically everything around us is frequencies and wavelengths. There's x-rays and MRI and FM radio and TV and GPS, everything, right? So all these frequencies are bouncing around us all the time. That's a whole other conversation, potential health hazard. But uh, you know, within that small range of frequencies, there's a tiny piece in the middle called visible light. So it just happens that we can't see x-rays, but we can see the color of red or blue. So within that is visible light, and visible light is the spectrum of blue, you know, violet, let's say, to red, but really we'll just say ultraviolet to infrared, so just a little bit further outside that spectrum. And we know that human bodies are very sensitive to light. So we think about that in terms of, let's say, getting a tan, Right, so you expose this, the, uh, your skin to sunlight, let's say, on the back of the ship in between lectures, and you, you should have some change in your skin. Right? So we know that we're, skin, we're, we're light sensitive, but we also know things like we make vitamin D from UVB. Right? We know that certain uh, frequencies of ultraviolet light are actually very antimicrobial, antifungal. And so we're starting to look at the light spectrum therapeutically. Uh, again, you know, if you want to talk about the toxicity and deficiency thing, to some extent, I might say that we wouldn't need as much therapy with light if we still had the same type of exposures to sun. But like many things, at one point, let's say in the 70s, raise your hand, I want to know, who went on their roof, lathered in baby oil with a reflector? Come on, be honest. I know you did. So, <laughs> so with iodine, I never did. That's, that's even, wow, you're hardcore. So... <laughs> So we know that the skin is sensitive to light, and we know you could become a little sun toxic, right? That's a little too much sunlight. Now, now what are we doing? We're avoiding the sun at all costs. It's like this crazy ball of fire in the sky that we should never be exposed to. We're covering up all the time, and we're not. We're covered in 
um, you know, sunscreen, which has its own toxicity issues potentially. So, um, you know, now we're now we're sunlight deficient, I would argue, and as a result, we see pandemic amounts of vitamin D deficiencies, um, <clears throat> amongst other things. So, but now it's becoming a you know a therapy. So now we need to supplement light to make up for the deficiency we've created by avoiding the sun, which actually had all of it in there in the first place. So, you know, so so we're using UV therapeutically as an antimicrobial. Uh, they're starting to do research on green light for uh, insulin sensitivity and uh, also for skin health. But we're, we're also using uh, in red, near infrared, and infrared at just a range of frequencies therapeutically for other cellular recovery. And so uh, globally, we're seeing things, they're doing some research, uh, this guy Kim, I forget where he is, it might be in Japan, uh, but he's doing a red light therapy directly to the skull at 40 hertz and he's seeing changes and shrinking of amyloid, uh, amyloid plaques and, and tau tangles. Uh, it's known to be a general anti-inflammatory agent, uh, helps to stimulate properly CNS, so we're getting um, you know, better, better stimulation in our synapses in our brain, uh, wound healing in, in, in local areas at high dose pain modulation, and then we're also starting to see changes in cholesterol synthesis and also insulin regulation. Also, like hyperbaric, and I forget who may have said it earlier, it may have been Dr. Rosignol or I'm not sure, but um, you know, the dose is the issue again. So just like in HBOT, the dose is an issue. We don't really have a great formula for saying this is exact amount of pressure, amount of oxygen, and know that they're getting the exact amount. I think we're having the same issues in terms of red light. There's so many sources of red light, different power densities at different frequencies. Uh, you know, so they're studying kind of all of them in little pieces but not necessarily uh, narrowing that down into the exact amount, but it's coming. What does it have to do with the mitochondria specifically? I would say we can narrow it down to these three things, cytochrome C, reactive oxygen species, and nitric oxide. So.